Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today it's my pleasure to welcome my friend Billy Lavoie Bailly, as the French say. And he has, for the last 10 years, been the CTO of gaming and esports at IBM. Uh, he has an interesting consulting background where he started his career. And now he is back to his entrepreneurial journey as the president of Generation Esports and Video Game Consulting. He has so much great insight on how to approach the space, and his experience in esports is unparalleled. Let's talk to Billy. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the, the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, Billy, thank you so much for joining me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Uh, we've known each other for, I want to say, a couple of years now, and I've always no. been fascinated uh, with what you bring to the space and really impressed by the way you look at the space and really excited to share that with our listeners today. So thank you again for joining me. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me, John. Really excited to be here. Absolutely. And so you've had an incredible career. Uh, I believe you were with IBM for what, something like 10 years? Is that right? Almost 11. Almost 11, yes. Almost yeah. 11. Now you're yeah. going off on your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, anybody who follows you on LinkedIn or any other social platform knows this very well. Um, I've had the opportunity to see you personally in Dallas just recently. And so you are all over the place. I love it. I'm excited to share your story. So why don't you tell our listeners before we get started, or as we get started, I should say, how did this incredible journey start for you as a gamer and a business professional as you find yourself now? Ah, uh, yeah, very good question. Very good question. So uh, let's, let's go back about 14 years or so, John. So uh, back in the day, I was a, what do I call a, a PMO architect technologist, where I'd usually be leading like large efforts, large enterprise efforts for like media companies, um, companies in Burbank, Hollywood, uh, East Coast, things like Warner Brothers and whatnot. And uh, what happened one day is apparently some folks from IBM found me. And they're like, who is this guy that he knows all this about games? He knows all about movies and videos and designing and architecture like what does he not have under his hat? Wow, yeah. <laughs> and so let's let's go ahead and invite him in. So I was kind of uh, fastly recruited by a number of companies. I was an independent consultant uh, prior to my IBM career and worked a lot with different studios, game startups, uh, doing a lot of work. And, you know, the funny thing was I actually fell into the game world by complete accident. Mm. It was a complete accident and I never looked back. <laughs> so, That's the way to do it. <laughs> Similar to me. So I keep going. What? What happened was um, a colleague of mine was looking for a, a program manager, project manager, as well as an architectural uh, individual that had a agile and sprint experience. Mm -hmm. He says, hey, I had this very awesome large game studio. Would you like to join me on this? So I actually fell into the, the, the game world kind of backwards, where I fell into working with the leadership, you know, the executives in the game studios, the C-suite designers and senior architects, and then just kept on going started work with esports, video yeah, games, yeah. and working as, across the component. So uh, it was a very cool falling in backwards event that happened. <laughs> sure. Well, a, a lot of our audience probably recognizes that gaming is much more broad than esports. I always say that esports is a microcosm of gaming. It's uh, The way I define it is an esport is a competitive video game that has enough infrastructure and following to have professional leagues and teams. And so it sounds like you got into gaming. Was there a fork in the road that where esports specifically captured your interest or a unique opportunity arose for you to enter specifically the gaming or I'm sorry, the esports industry within gaming? Yes. Yes, there was. So when we think about it, as I was working with various studios, uh, the various studios were looking at ways, hmm, I'm seeing this little shiny nugget called esports or yeah. competitive gaming. And we need someone to kind of take the helm and kind of take charge and do this. So naturally, I'm very like, hey, I like to try things. Let me try it and reach yeah. out to this. So I started to just actually engage with the studios and help them kind of mature in a sense, you know, some of their esport platforms and maturity and getting into that. Um, without naming a few names, some of the studios I work with, there they were starting to re-architecture their landscape to approach the esport environment. And that's where I came in very heavily, was help them adapt business processes, business needs, 
uh, looking at different types of technologies, what types of things would impact their growth in esports, and kind of help you know coach them along, mature them along, and and that's where because I, I just like I just dove in. I said, hey, this is really cool. Um, I helped them. In some cases, I had to sway them not to get into esports like right away because they needed some sure. mature steps to kind of cross that bridge. Yeah, uh, that that's kind of a general sense of how they got started with me. Cool. So tell me more broadly because we could get into very specifics with you know every company has their certain challenges or I would say this for you and this for you. I consult brands and agencies as well, so we're we're kind of similar in that way. But if you would say broadly. What are some of the steps that you've seen that companies need to make in order to effectively enter the esports space rather than entering now and it being a complete disaster? Okay, yeah, good good question. Very good question. I'll, I'll speak broadly to this. So I think some of the aspects I've looked at that is what is your main goal of why you're doing that? Why are you actually trying to enter the esports space, number one? So number two is I asked them, do you understand what the community is, how the community interacts, how they evolve, how they respond? Even before you talk tech or the business corp that goes into the world of esports, the number one that I keep in the back of my head every day is that esports and the video game world is a community, right? Hmm. And they love to be engaged. How do you engage them? How do you respond to them? So these are kind of the, the messages I work with with the major studios and some of the investors because as you know john a lot of non-endemics right are now involved in the world of esports Absolutely. and to those folks not in the game world what that means simply is those folks that non-endemics are traditionally not related to gaming so for example uh we we've never seen geico insurance but now we see geico insurance we've never seen state farm now we see state farm so those are what i consider non-endemics uh, versus a company like hyperx or razor which is endemic to the game community. So bringing all those components together are very important to start your journey into the world of esports. Yeah, that's well said, you know, and I think, well, one thing that's really important to understand is that these non-endemic partnerships uh, are greatly fueling our industry uh, from a revenue perspective more than other forms of monetization currently. And so I think it's very important that not only the brands understand how to enter the space effectively, but also, that the leagues and the teams understand how to fulfill those partnerships and to make sure that those partnerships result in ROI for those brands. Because sometimes we think, yeah. hey, you should just support our space to support us. But guess <laughs> what? In the real world, the reason that companies partner and sponsor with things is because they make more money than if they didn't do it or if they did it somewhere else, right? <laughs> so. Right. Have you seen some examples of companies who have been successful in their approach in esports that some of our audience can look at and say, that's a great model to follow after? Yeah, yeah. So even before I answer that, let's let's think about why some of these companies are entering or how they're responding. So one of the key things when we think about some of these companies that are entering the space, in particular the, the non-endemics that we're talking about here is that how am I going to respond to community? How am I going to engage with the community organically, right? Yeah. So some of the ways that's done. So that's very important for a company. So some of the companies that we've seen that, um, I'll start with a good example of a company that started probably prematurely, but now they got it right. So back in the early days when Budweiser started to enter in Germany, the problem was they were catering to 14 to 16 year olds. <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> and, and the parents in Germany were like, uh-uh-uh, <laughs> right? right? Right, right, because the, the, the gaming and esport community is a younger set, which we're all pretty much aware of. Yeah. But at the same time, how do you engage with your brand, right? Mm. Or how do you engage with your community? Because if you're going to enter, you, you have to think about two things. How am I responding? How am I reacting? Um, do I know how they're reacting? So some of those things that they're thinking about, too, on the business side of the sponsor is, am I understanding what I'm responding to? How am I engaging? What are some things? Am I getting ROI, those kind of things? And those are things that are done very organically. If you don't do them organically, us gamers can see it a mile away. We're like, ah, right. nope, nope, <laughs> not going to happen. So things like Budweiser. So we now see Budweiser is a very key supporter, right? Yes. So for example, something like the Dallas Fuel, you know, Neck in the Woods, other companies such as that. Um, also, uh, Gucci has done it very effectively because they say, hey, I'm going to do this 
organically right. and engage organically with you. Um, you know, even even State Farm Insurance, um, probably us gamers wouldn't be saying this even five years ago, but you have someone like a State Farm entity. I'm responding appropriately to the community. I'm not yeah. overburdening myself. I'm not overbearing. I'm able to understand what the gamers are doing or what they're not doing or how they're responding. And that's very important. Absolutely. The, the way I look at it is simply uh, the community wants their experiences enhanced. If you find what the community wants, but they can't attain for themselves and your brand enables them to get that, then mm -hmm. you're embraced. And I look at a, a number of different opportunities to enhance experiences. You have the fan experience, watching a stream or watching a competition in person, which is coming back very soon. We're very excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember, too, that this community wants to play themselves. So they don't just want to sit on the sidelines and watch the pros. They want to <laughs> play themselves. And in fact, the barriers to play are much lower, especially as we get older than traditional sports. Right. Because. Right. Right. I've talked to some people say, yeah, you know, I'm a, I love playing football, but I can't get out up there on the field. I'm in my 40s, but I can play a video game because I don't have that, you know, those physical limits as I would yes. with traditional sports. And mm -hmm. then there's a number of other things that I think you can enhance. Are there some examples or, or desires of the community, whether that be, you know, focusing on validation or other behaviors that our community really responds to that you've seen? Uh, yes, big time, big time, right? So, for example, we're, we're thinking about some of the, the games that are very popular that folks may hear about quite often, like whether it's, you know, LOL, League of Legends, or whether it's Call of Duty, whether it's StarCraft II, right? Because what you're saying to your point, John, which is dead on, is that they want to be engaged and be understood. Right. And when we're looking at things that are happening during the gameplay, what's something that's very salient to me or something very cool to the community? something that we can grab and kind of push out like almost automatically real time based on response you know sometimes a lot of things that are going on for example in a broadcast of an esport event there's a lot of engineers that are doing things manually to kind of do clips and replays and other activities right now if we can bring sentiment and salient activity into that process that would not only enhance the community but also reduce the burden on the engineers so they can focus on other things in the gameplay good as point. an example good point well, we're talking about a number of different ways um, that we are either typically seen brands uh, execute in the esports space when they're successful or ways that maybe we wish <laughs> brands would do. But <laughs> one brand that approached esports very differently than others is IBM. And this was your former employer. Can you talk a little bit about what their approach was and why their approach was unique? Yeah. So first of all, I, I say this very humbly is that um, in the starting days when I was, in a sense, educating IBM about esports, you know, helping executives understand what is what does this mean? How does this work? How does it impact? How do we interact with this digitally native freeway called games and esports? So in working with that type of aspect, um, we're looking at things such as let's use some of the unique abilities business wide, consulting wise, technology wise to apply that natively and organically to the esport community all right so as you as we know john the esport world is a community very well knit community almost sometimes so small it's kind of like a knitting club <laughs> at times <laughs> it feels that but, way for sure <laughs> but at, at times too you don't i would not go to a customer and say hey do you want a z server right that that, right. that would not find the game community so things which i would often teach my ibm peers and folks i'd mentor would be get to know the world don't be afraid to go to startups and meetups and clubs and culture clubs you know you know put away the jacket for a while right <laughs> <laughs> Good point. or even even turn off your selling dna at times and just go out and just go out and be just go out and be yeah um point. there was a time that, that was very fun for me and also kind of a little embarrassing so a number of years ago um i think this was about five years ago i had a chance to actually be introduced to to a scarlet for the first time uh -huh. i'm like Holy cats! It's like a, a you know, like someone being introduced to you know Bono from U2. I'm like, for real, for real? Yeah. So here I am, a very polished IBMer, getting a chance to meet Scarlett, and for the lack of me, I cannot create a sentence. A verb or noun cannot be put together for almost a half an hour. I was so amazed. Of, 
actually sitting next to Scarlett in one of the shoutcaster booths. I was like, ah, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, it was it was so fun and humbling. Um, it took me about a half an hour to form verbs and sentences. So eventually, something must have gone right. <laughs> She's like, hey, we should go with our peeps over to the to the meltdown bar in Montreal. So that was good afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. So I I think. Yeah, when you talk about IBM, that's some that's a company that is endemic to gaming kind of loosely, right? Because they make computers and uh, people mm-hmm. can, you know, game on yeah. PCs and things of that nature. But there's also a pretty strong B2B play there where I think a lot of brands, it may not be obvious that your brand has a play in esports, but in fact you do, and you can organically do that. In fact, one of my favorites is DHL. And so DHL is a very well-known case study in the Dota 2, Dota 2 community. Mm-hmm. They've, had, Big time. Yeah. they've had events where people are chanting DHL. And they did yeah. uh, some pretty in-depth engagement there. They did content with Sir Action Slacks, who's an influencer in the Dota 2 community. They did some in-game content. They even did a mobile game uh, with IffyBot, I want to say, if I'm remembering correctly. But the mm-hmm. piece of it that I love the most is their business is logistics. It's shipping things around the world, right? And so part of their part of their partnership with Dota 2 was they were the logistics partner, quite literally shipping the production equipment around the world to different Mm -hmm. events. And so the reason I love that is you can have an organic fit in this space oftentimes even if it's not obvious from the outset. Right. Right, right. Well, you think about that. This is this is a very cool example because the, the, the you look at this example and you say, "Hey, think about all the things that need to happen to make an esport event click." Right. right. You know, you talk to any uh, engineer at either like at ESL or DreamHack or StarLadder, and they say, "You know, one of my biggest headaches is getting my gear, my server farm, through borders, right, across borders." Good point. Um, sometimes there's been events where the event has started four hours after the gear has arrived. <laughs> Think about <laughs> the, the stress level. Not ideal. <laughs> Not ideal, right? So having a, having a valuable partner that can bring that together, cross borders, work on different things. And now think about it. Now we have the influx of blockchain, which can be brought into that same picture, which can reduce that overhead even further, right? So, for example, the customs officers, the import officers, the, the folks at the shipyard, the folks at the airline, they can all see what's going on on the blockchain and even simplify it even further for folks like DHL and others. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. I want to uh, pivot to your current business because I think it's really exciting what you're doing now. You're essentially taking all of your experience that you've gained over the last number of years, and it sounds like you're going back to this consulting approach if i have that correct so you're you're it sounds sure. like your career is coming full circle you started with consulting <laughs> you had a, a time with the large corporation and now back out on your own teaching other people what you've learned through this time so why don't you share with us exactly what you're doing what your goals are with this new company sure well thank you very much yeah very excited about uh, generation what we're doing here is a uh, two prong wear two hats no pun intended so one hat, I'm consulting with actual game studios. So Generation Esports and Video Games is the name of the company, so I have, wear two hats. So hat number one, of course, is the esports consulting role. Hat number two is the actual studio consulting role, right? So if we think about the two environments, so think about the ecosystem of esports. What, what all happens to make things click? Things like arena, stadium designs, things like developing broadcast and cabling and think about things like telco and 5g all the things that make something click either in an arena or stadium or with a team or with a publisher so is what i'm consulting with in those areas on the studio side a lot of advancements are going on in studio design like devops we hear that term quite a lot or things that with the, the teams like the scrum agile and the discipline of designing the actual game things like how to better support cloud development and architecture you know, working with the actual executives at a game studio, as well as the executives in the esports world. So what I'm doing, and, and what is very cool too, is even though I have that IBM experience, now I can be a bit more agnostic, you know, sure. working with all the various different platforms, John. So, you know, maybe one day it's an Amazon day, maybe one day it's an IBM day, maybe yeah. one day yeah. it's a Google day based on that. So now I can feel much closer 
you know, to the gaming community and offer solutions that I think that would really, you know, offer something of competitive advantage, better ROI, um, also maybe help people slow down a bit. Like, let's, you know, sure. let's take this train off the track a bit, take it into the side yard, talk about it, and put it back on the, the rail yard again, because things are happening so quickly in esports. I think one would be foolish to call themselves an expert at this time. All right. things are, are flying. Yeah, things are always changing. You have to have your finger on the pulse, and what happened yesterday may not be relevant today, right? Correct. Well, you talked a little bit about being agnostic, and this is something I can relate to. I started my own business uh, eight or nine months ago, and that's one thing that I really love is the creative, the creativity, the flexibility. I've found myself in big corporations kind of bumping up against the guardrails of the priorities <laughs> of the business, right? Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, we got to do this thing. This is amazing. This would be so great for the community and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, John, we're focused on this for Q4 or whatever. <laughs> and I'm just rolling my eyes and I'm like, ah, oh, you got to be kidding me. And so, you know, it's you can't go after sh every shiny ball, of course. But it is pretty fun when you're doing your own thing that it's up to you what you do, right? So what exactly. has that experience been like for you as you now, now you you don't have somebody else's priorities, but you also have maybe a little bit of a weight on your shoulders of responsibility that it's up to you to keep this business going. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, as you hit on, John, one of the things that's important to understand about companies is that, you know, sometimes you know, companies may miss the boat, so to speak, sure. or they may miss the next big thing or the next important thing that has a big impact on economies worldwide. Um, so um, you probably heard the term, sometimes you need to uh, break a couple eggs to make an omelet, right? I've heard that, yes. <laughs> and, when, and when sometimes the companies are afraid to crack some of those eggs to make an omelet, that makes it difficult for those that want to really achieve sometimes in a company. As to your example, and probably to some of my examples. So, you know, there, there were times in my career where sometimes I would bump my head against the wall occasionally, again and again and again and again, trying to emphasize or educate or talk about something. Yeah. But now that I'm an entrepreneur, I'm able to take that and actually just kind of fly, just really fly with that idea, create that vision and something that's tangible, right? right. Something that has real value for the game community, real value for the esport community something that can be delivered, you know, agnostically across various platforms or business processes to have the impact. Because one thing that's really cool about that is you can make the decision now to say, I can serve this, I want to serve this client, or maybe I don't want to serve right. that client. Right? That's another power that we have as entrepreneurs is you know, we can choose and say, maybe your values don't mix with mine right now. Right. Good point. Now, uh, let me ask you if you experience this, because I do at times. Sometimes I have to check myself and say, wait, am I spending my time making money or am I spending my time <laughs> on stuff that's not going to make money or just feel cool? You know, sometimes <laughs> being busy can be a substitute for actually being productive. And you say, wow, I'm getting all this done. And then you look down back at your day or your week and say, what did I do that was billable? Is this something that you've experienced in your consulting uh, or am I all alone in this feeling? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it does happen. It does happen to the best of us. So don't take it personal. It's like, you know, sometimes I think one of the uh, value adds to being yourself, being your company, you know, you, ha you have a smaller team, you're able to identify things. Maybe, maybe you can hand some things off or sure. learn to delegate. One of the one of the things I'm having to learn myself right now as a learning point is learning how to delegate more uh, to my team. Um, yeah. Because being the, the chief cook and bottle washer at IBM for so many years is you know, I had to keep things running and keep things sane so that the, the, the gaming world would not see what's behind the curtain, right? Sure. <laughs> Good point. And, and so now I'm learning how to delegate so I can focus on, you're saying, those things to monetize and really make an impact on my company too, um, because my uh, one of the, the the missions of being alive on our planet is to make money. Sometimes <laughs> it sure. I mean, I, I I break it down to the simplest component of can you pay your bills, right? I remember when I first announced my company, I was talking to somebody on the phone, and I made some comment like, "And we're gonna find out if I can pay my bills doing this." And he laughed and said, "Well, I guess it that's what it all comes down to, right? Like, can you find something you enjoy and?" you know, make enough to pay the bills, hopefully make some to save as well. 
Um, yeah. I do yeah. want to dig a little deeper into delegating, though, uh, because I mm-hmm. think there's some value for the audience here. What have you found is successful? Because I think when you're an entrepreneur, you're the head of a small company, maybe you started by yourself and you start to grow, for example, or you just have a small team. It's a question of what do I do myself? And if I'm hiring people, am I hiring somebody who is skilled, you know, is a higher level person? Or am mm-hmm. I hiring somebody who is a lower cost and is just getting started because I just need some organization or or somebody to procure some some data for me? Uh, what has that been your experience with finding out how to successfully delegate? Yeah, yeah. So I think just a caveat here. One of the things I've been blessed with here at Generation Esports and Video Game Consulting is that you know over the course of my career, I had a chance to interact with hundreds of people. So now I was able to go out and actually choose and hand select several people to join my team in the course of my 14, 15 year journey across the game world, which is very exciting, very humbling to be able to do that. Yeah. So for example, one, one skill set maybe I'm not strong at is is doing marketing and media. Like mm. what, what's a post on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram? So now I have an expert help me on that to guide right. me on that. Something, for example. Um, other areas which I know I'll need to use in some of my big pipeline projects is things like uh, PMO directors or project managers or folks that are heavy into like data science and data science engineering and those kind of concepts. So those things are all built into my pipeline. So now what I'm doing is hand selecting those folks that will help me delegate. Because when I was at IBM, my manager used to joke is like, how do we duplicate Billy? Because <laughs> there's only one of him. Right. And he's wanted right. here, 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 here. Point. <laughs> but so that's why I'm learning to delegate. It's a process. I admit there's sometimes I've wanted to pick up the phone and call some like and say no, give them the opportunity to try it and learn and, mm. and grow. So I've had to put that phone back down again. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's part of leadership is enabling people to grow and learn as you're also trying to get these projects done, right? That's correct. That so, is very correct. So what I'm picking up from what you said is essentially focus on your strengths and find people who are complimenting you. And yes. I think that's a great lesson too. I, I was I worked with a executive coach over COVID that was very beneficial to me. And mm. we had an interaction one day where uh, I said, you know what? Um, I'm, I don't have a lot of design skills. You know, um, I, you know, I don't really know Photoshop, Illustrator, these other things. And I might be able to do more if I, you know, took a class or I learned how to do these things. And she said, John, don't do that. <laughs> and I said, why not? <laughs> she said, John, you may have that need, but you're never going to be a 10 as a designer. <laughs> you're like, right? <"What?" laughs> like, no matter how much work I would put into being a designer, I would be maybe a six, right? Six and a half, <laughs> seven at, on my best day. She said, identify the things that you do well. And rather than working on your weaknesses, focus on improving your strengths and then hire for your weaknesses. And it sounds that you're echoing that as well. That's, yes, very sound advice. Very sound advice. Because there's some things that I would admit, for example, I'm not a rock star in, say, cybersecurity. I would not want to say, I'm a cybersecurity dude. So that's why I have a cybersecurity expert now on my team and those kind of things. Um, you know, look at some of the advances in games, for example, you know, digital twins, right? Hmm. So that's a new advancement. So I work with some of the experts in that area. Yeah. With the different types of productions, augmented reality, AR, VR, for some of the esports experiences. Um, so you're right, John. There, there's things just your, your customers enjoy when you're upfront with them and say, hmm, I may need to grab an advisor to do X, Y, or Z, or let me get right. back to you on that. Right. Oftentimes when I'm mentoring folks is, you know, they want to get in there. I'm going to make the first sale. I'm going to make it happen right now, right now. Right. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Let's, let's slow down and, and understand what the customer wants. Talk to them. Enjoy with them. Sometimes turn off your selling DNA and just engage. Absolutely. And then eventually that relationship and that sale will happen. Well, it sounds like that's some that's something that relational selling, if you will, or just building relationships is something that comes very natural to you. I know that uh, our interactions have felt very relational. In fact, our first meeting was, <laughs> what was the name of that place? We had pancakes. Original for Pancake House. Yes. Yeah. OPH is what they call it here in Minnesota. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. To- 
I remember yes. Ubering through the snow drifts in January in <laughs> Minneapolis, and our good friend Rebecca Lingawa said, you got to meet Bill. So I was like, hey, Bill, let's get together. And you said, let's have pancakes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It builds character, right? So you get a, you get a couple right. frozen nose hairs, but you get some great pancakes. <laughs> That's right. It was, it was all worth it. And uh, why don't you share a little bit about that, too? Because what I found is very very beneficial for both sides uh, in a sales relationship is r building that relationship. One thing I've experienced is that what's a no today could be a yes tomorrow. And mm. you position yourself well when that instantly happens and there's an immediate need. And it's like, oh, Bill, I know him. I've been talking to him for the last three weeks about Dota or the NFL or whatever, right? And so right. we already right. have that, that relationship built. The other thing that I think a lot of people fail to do, and you mentioned it briefly there, is going to a partner, a potential client, and rather than pitching your stuff, finding out their needs. Right. And that's, that, that's so important. I always use this example when I was at GameStop. People would pitch me all the time, right? And they would assume, oh, you want to increase sales in video games or you want to increase your, your digital sales or things like that where people thought we needed help. And not that those aren't things you know to help with, but the number one thing I needed was foot traffic into stores. <laughs> and the reason was- Some basics, yeah. Right, my employee was the core, ad the competitive advantage compared to our competitors. Because mm -hmm. you try going to Walmart, Best Buy, Target, asking anybody about what's the right game or the safe game for my kid, they don't know because they're just general retail employees. Some of them might happen to be gamers. But at GameStop, these are people who are so passionate about games. A lot of them work at GameStop just because of the discount. <laughs> That's the incentive to take <laughs> yeah. the job, right? right on. <laughs> and so if we could get somebody in a store, we knew that we had a great chance at closing that sale, much more than if they just went on the website uh, to learn about the game and to do reviews or what have you. And so if somebody came to me and asked me that, then they're developing a proposal mm -hmm. that is targeted to what I need. And when your proposal helps solve the problems that I that I need help with, mm -hmm. it's hard to turn that down. Right. 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 So is there anything that you'd share on that approach or success you've had in going to people and just listening, just being turning off that sales DNA and finding out what their needs are? Yeah, I mean, that that's a big example. I really like that one, John. It's a good question because when you think about how we engage as gamers, engage as architects or engineers or even players, right? Think about how you interact, say, in a, an event. Go to like a dream hack, right? Or go to an ESL event. Go to a Starletter event. You're seeing all the things that are going on in there, right? Yeah. So you just kind of like, just kind of like turn off your, your selling DNA, go in there and just start to mingle and jingle with the folks. Find out what they're talking about, what are they tweeting about, what are things happening, what are things, because each, some of these major events have different things happening at the same time, right? True. Maybe over here, this game is going on. Over here, there's a demonstration. Maybe it's augmented reality day and whatnot. So when we go into these events, what I like to do is just kind of like observe at first. Hmm. Be a silent observer. See what people are doing, how they're engaging. Start to approach people. You know, see, see what things are going on in commonality around that, right? Because a lot of times, you know, sometimes, at least in my experience, sales may happen by accident because you took the time to, to bump in some of the hot dog stand or bump in someone at the augmented reality Good stand point. and just start to yib yab, right? And, and just gel. Sometimes that's hard for what I would call traditional salespeople to do yeah. because yeah. sometimes you need a script or you need to be polished or you need to do this. In the game world, be yourself. Gamers respect that. If you don't know something, that's okay. Yeah. Go read up something, do some investigation, take some time and do that. And I think that's the cool thing about this world is that and why I felt so welcome and accepted into the game will just organically be yourself. Just connect and just enjoy. Um, as you know, John, I am also, in addition to an architect and technologist, also kind of a people person as well. Right. <laughs> and people just enjoy working with me. I yeah. think that's something that people learn to do. They adapt. The more you do it, and now that we're coming to kind of all that, what I call that COVID stalemate, right. that'll become even easier. Um, so just just some words to the wise. 
Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I, I've said a number of times uh, is a lot of business, and this is apart from esports. This is all of business. Right. A lot of business comes down to: Are you cool to hang out with? Now, obviously, it's important that you show up on time and that you work hard, <laughs> right? But let's uh, who needs that? <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> but there's a lot of smart people, and you know, at some yeah. point, yeah. you know, you have people with ten plus years of experience. Everybody's talented, right? Or everybody's knowledgeable. And there's the the genius jerk scenario, right? Where it's like, <laughs> yeah, this person is just a major jerk and they're terrible to be around but boy they sure are smart and they know a lot that that has a dead end at some point and yeah, what i i would say is much uh less limited is when you're enjoyable to work with because if i'm stuck in a room with you all day long right you think about our, our work environments not the last year with covid but typically when we're in offices we are spending time with our coworkers more than we are with our families, right? Mm -hmm. At times that's true. At times that's, that's true. And then sometimes you have this crazy deadline or you have to go on a trip for an extended period of time and you're stuck with somebody. And so the question is, can I stand you, number one, <laughs> and vice versa? Yeah. But secondly, if a deal goes sideways, if something doesn't go the right way, are you going to fly off the handle? Are you going to yell at me? Are you going to disrespect me? Or are we going to be able to work through respectfully a solution that meets both of our needs? Yeah. And I think one thing that's true that many people often don't recognize too, it, it, it's okay to have silent periods in your day with folks too, right? Mm. You don't always have to be filling that with noise and speech and whatnot. Oftentimes people respect you more just, for example, if you're answering a question or answering this or that, you know, take time to pause, just, just be quiet engage listen um and sometimes sometimes silence goes a long way as well in addition to conversation That's and what point. you're trying to demonstrate or pitch for example yeah I, i'm a talker myself so i i, I can use that reminder at times like, john just <laughs> shut up <laughs> one thing yeah, i want to all have to learn it <laughs> yeah no you're exactly right one thing one <laughs> thing i want to mention uh here really quick you, you mentioned about how the the gaming community, what they respond to. And I think it all comes down to your motives. And one thing that's cool about our community, I call it a healthy skepticism. I talk about it a lot with sponsors and stuff, but it's true with outsiders who are trying to come in as well. And it's like, we know that there's a lot of dollars, there's a lot of eyeballs in this space. And so now everybody who ignored us previously is now recognizing <laughs> us, right? That's one dynamic. But the other thing that's really cool is we we welcome and embrace individuals who come to the space for the right reasons. And if you're not a huge gamer, that's okay, right? If you're not mm -hmm. great at games, that's fine. I myself am not a high level talented gamer. <laughs> I just I you know, my only opportunity in the esports industry is through marketing, business development and consulting, let me tell you. And when you get me on the sticks, it's like, uh, oh, John. Well, you know what you should do, John, maybe a thought here is, you know, take an hour a day just to play something. Just, you know, put the business aside for a second. That's just true. Play and jam. And that's one thing I love about when I go into a studio is like, all right, we're just going to stop the meeting. Let's go grab some games. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because you know, that's something you want to do. And that's something I do. Even in, in my daily business world, I just like stop. I'm, I'm going to play something. Mm. Today's maybe Rocket League Day. Tomorrow might be Overwatch Day. Day right. after that is LOL Day. You know, just kind of. Keep yourself fresh. <laughs> Absolutely. How, tell me this, because I think a lot of people who are coming to our space, especially from the business side, I have a feeling that a lot of them have never experienced a tournament, a LAN party, or really even played the games that mm -hmm. they are working in from a business perspective. How important would you say it is that they experience that themselves? You know, I, I think that is, that's that's pretty key, pretty key. Now, I think there's other ways to approach that too. For example, maybe if, even if you don't have time to play a game, you know, throw up a Twitch stream or something, watch something here or there, pull up a YouTube and just engage. Yeah. Um, keep yourself kind of immersed so you know what's going on or engage with those. 
you know, folks that maybe are not the best game player, just go and play it. It's okay to fail. That's the great thing yeah. about the game space. You can fail, <laughs> right? Right. Go in and play and get your ass kicked somewhere. Excuse my French, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Just get beat up. Um, you know, that's one of the things I put in my um, in my profile when I send my little pitch deck. Is I, you know, I enjoy getting beat up in a good game of StarCraft here and there, and and uh, LOL or Valorant or something. It's okay to lose, right? It's just fun. Yeah. <laughs> It gives you a dose of humility, too, at the same time. And, hey, it's a good practice for entrepreneurship, I would say, as well. <laughs> it is. It you know, really some is. ups and downs. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about this uh, before we end our, our time together here. Through your incredible career, we've touched on it a little bit, but one of the things that you've done is you have trotted the globe, and you have <laughs> yes. gone to a number of different countries. You have had an impact and an influence all over the world. I think it's one of the most amazing parts of your story. Share a little bit about that with our audience. Yes, yeah. So it's it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to take your talent and help spread the word around the world, literally, literally, going to different places. Um, oftentimes, I've been asked to uh, speak to you know politicians, various governments, and help them kind of present the world of games. One of the cool parts of, about the game world and the esports world is that there's a lot of technology that goes into this landscape. Yeah. And so think of all the educational needs that come with that. So I've been to places like you know like China. I've been to South America, uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, UK, Oceania, all these regions. And one of the cool things, in addition to talking about esports and different technologies is a way that you can combine those things globally because games are apolitical, right? They mm. cross borders yep. uh, that are very much engaged. Everybody knows what a game is and how to uh, enjoy. And so what you do is you take that anchor of games and esports and use that to facilitate things like discussions around education, yeah. uh, STEM programs, ed tech program, P tech programs, collaboration with schools and universities, Right, because the game world is a great anchor to build and build and build on that, right? And to keep people engaged. Maybe it's a new type of recruiting tool for various countries. Bring people together, um, educate youngsters for the next career growth in this space, because uh, there's a lot of need, a lot of demand for these types of technology positions. That's well said. You know, you touched on something that I'm really passionate about, and that's using games as education. Um, I have a six-year-old son, and so I know that he's growing up in a world where you can't keep keep kids from playing games even if you wanted to. And I'm not <laughs> saying that you should, but you know, there's a variety of games out there, right? There's some games out there that you don't want your children playing. Um, people our age, uh, you could probably have been kept from playing games if your parents really wanted to because you know, they could say no to buying a console for Christmas. They could say no to a Game Boy, you know, no to that expensive PC, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, gaming has even become much more of a social network than Big time. Big just time. specifically the act of gaming. Um, and so I'm very interested, knowing that my son is going to grow up in this gamified world, that he's able to leverage it in a way that's most beneficial for him, specifically from an educational standpoint. What are some of the things that you've experienced that where gaming can be tied to education in a positive way? Yeah, there's quite a number of examples around that because uh, there's been a number of universities, uh, social groups, governments that have said, hey, we're going to provide some foundation and games will be our base to do that. So, for example, a country will say, we're going to use your expertise, Billy, to help us use games and esports as an anchor and then to build that into a package with education and universities and schooling to be part of that, right? Yeah, because one of the things that's very cool is that you know youngsters can see the light at the end of the tunnel. For example, if I'm doing math or calculus or uh -huh. physics on a normal day, I'm like, oh man, this this stuff is a little painful. But if I'm going to see, I'm going to develop a really cool, you know, physics engine for Rocket League. I can see my result. It's like, wow, point. that's something that I can actually do, or I can build something cool like a a new type of wall in Valorant or something based on this and this and this. Right. So. That's an easy kind of piece of candy of tying education uh, with a game space mm. uh, because the value can be seen almost immediately of what I'm doing, what I'm learning. I um, mean, look at all the coding camps 
but I've been a part of uh, throughout the world in various countries. Yes. Uh, looking at things in addition to the game and esports world is those additions to technologies like cloud and programming and scripting and those things, um, which on an average day may seem kind of dry to some people, sure. but yet they can see the outcome. I'm like, holy cats, I can develop this new type of game with this new augmented reality to be part of this. And it helps me learn. The teachers can feel comfortable too. They're like, huh, he's actually learning some physics over there. Should I tell him? <laughs> no, no, no. Just don't tell him he's it. learning <laughs> physics. Yeah, don't don't spoil it. <laughs> right. No, that's awesome because because gaming is so broad, you have basically, I think I saw a stat the other day that, um, at least in the U.S., 96% of boys high school age and younger are playing video games. It was something like that. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. And so you have this passion that is so incredibly broad across all of these different backgrounds because you have so many different types of games, right? So yeah. the act yeah. of gaming, which is very broad and diverse, applies to so many different young people. Mm -hmm. And then you can tie that passion to real world application through education. Right. The right. other thing that I've seen is there's industries like uh, like the airline industry who need pilots. The military is in desperately need, desperate need of pilots currently. And when you see drones being flown, in some cases, you quite literally have the drone pilots using an Xbox controller. Right. And so you right. have these skills and these abilities that can translate directly to real world needs beyond just the act of being a pro gamer for years, for a few years on stages around the world, which, you know, that's a great dream to chase as well. <laughs> but just like with traditional sports, we want to enable people to have lifelong careers. Right. And gaming exactly. is a great way to foster our youth with that. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, as you hit on, John, you think about it, too, is that, you know, even think about the period during COVID, right, is that games kept people pretty much sane and connected in a, in a big way. We looked at okay. the increase of gaming activity was probably increased, what, 78 percent or so on some of the numbers I've been seeing. And in fact, my workload alone during that period probably amped up about 500 percent, literally, you know, wow. helping with new technologies and business models around that period. And those models are only going to advance. They're not going to go backwards. They're going to advance mm -hmm. and mature. But think of all the ways like education, uh, healthcare and gaming, uh, games have been used in, in aspects in hospitals, for example, for folks that have had strokes in the past. Yeah. Uh, gaming is a good way because the, the game ability that a patient is doing refires neurons in someone's brain versus doing like traditional cool. stroke therapy, right? Right. So all those activities can be brought together and there's other activities to help with like PTSD and other types of uh, social needs. Um, myself here in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, I also do some uh, mentoring of some of the young folks, you know, that maybe have gotten in trouble because high school was actually boring for them, but they were <laughs> smart, super smart. Sure. Right. So how do you channel all that creativity into something, you know, positive? And so I've been working with some number of kids in my neighborhoods to, to take some of that that angst, you know, is like, I have all this energy, I have all this talent, but I have nowhere to go with it. I don't want to right. kind of break into my school cyber system anymore. I'll get in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you know what I'm saying? yeah, <laughs> it's a great way for young people to channel their energy, especially, especially when we recognize that education is not necessarily a one size fits all and that you can have some really bright individuals who have promising futures that when you get them in the right channel with something that they're passionate about and ways that they uniquely learn, they yep. can not only be very successful, but they can benefit many people around the world um, as a result of what they're doing. Big time, big time. One last thing while I have you just for a few minutes this is something I've always wanted to ask you because you have such in-depth experience. You have a global perspective of esports, which is essentially what do you see as what's coming next in I'll let you take it where you want from an esports perspective, but let's talk innovation. Let's talk, you know, this next year, whether it's the end of 2021, whether it's 2022, what should we look forward to in the esports space? Oh, uh, yes, yes. So a as we're talking right now, you notice my screen behind me is like, so I'm at the stadium today, aren't I? <laughs> I <laughs> so would this assume is, so. <laughs> this is something that's going to be very key, is kind of a, like a hybrid immersive world. As we come back together for esports and video games, 
Uh, people want to be comfortable again, getting back together with more and more other of us humans after being separated for so, so many months. So I see augmented reality experiences, uh, hybrid type events, you know, both in stadium and arena, as well as a combination of uh, perhaps, you know, at home or other types of clubs or other types of locations, right? right? There might be split, like split center arenas built or split center designs built so that folks can be either be at the full event or be in partial events, you know, yeah. surrounding around that area as well. Um, so I see that a big one. In addition to combining that with mobile gaming and mobile esports, which is just skyrocketing day after day after day. So combining the experience of a mobile esport event, a mobile experience, something that I can do and compete with others. And you probably heard this term a couple of times, John, in the world called democratizing esports, right? Mm -hmm. Getting more and more people using different technology platforms right. to have them more engaged. Because right? yeah. not everybody works for EA, not everybody works for Riot, not everybody's at Activision. You have the other 97% of the game world out there wanting to engage and immerse and be interactive with each other. And those are some of the things that are going to be increasing as well. Um, so those are some of the things I see in my Magic 8-Ball coming out for the next year or so. That's incredible. Well, I really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to those things happening. I've seen a few things a few of those things myself personally and so it's going to be wonderful to watch these things unfold and see how generation esports and video game consulting helps to support our world uh anybody who is listening to this who has a question about esports uh or you're a video game developer you know how can you move in this world bill is somebody that i would highly recommend that you reach out to great guy in addition to having some incredible <laughs> insight you. on this space. So, uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today thank on you. the DLC Drop <laughs> Podcast. It's been my pleasure to have you. Yes, thank you, John. Same here. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> Great. We'll talk with you soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review. 